everybody. Welcome to our real life online experience. We hope you guys stayed safe during Hurricane Ian this week. If you're located here in the Florida area, it's a good sign. If you're watching this, it probably means you've got power. So we're excited about that. We'll be continuing our Doomsday Prep series, streaming live to the Claremont campus with the Claremont campus pastor, Mark Milan today. But before we do that, let's worship together. God, we thank you so much just for your protection over our friends and our families and our communities this week. God, we thank you that you are here with us and we show up and we just say, God, we're ready to hear from you today and we worship you in Jesus' name, amen.
washing of your Hey, well, we're so glad you guys joined us to worship today. And we want to welcome you, especially if you're new, maybe this is your first time here. We do have a way for you to get plugged in and learn a little bit more about what's happening in the life of our church. So all you got to do is scan the QR code that's on the screen right now, or you can head to real.life slash connect. Well, obviously, as many of you know, especially if you're here in the Florida area, this last week, Hurricane Ian came through. And I think one of the things that we've been talking about just as a church is how timely it is and an opportunity for us to be the church and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Often in times like this, we go into self-preservation mode. All you gotta do is look down the water aisle at any grocery store to know that's true. But what we wanna encourage you and even what we've been talking about in our Doomsday Prep series is what does it look like to live and love in the here and now and how do we reach out? So we just wanna encourage you this week, take those opportunities, check on the vulnerable in your communities, even the neighbors right next door if you have any elderly single moms widows do they have what they need do they need any help maybe cleaning up their yard what does that look like for each of us to own being the church right where we live that's the encouragement that we want to give you even in light of so much of what we've been teaching in the doomsday prep series so far and maybe you're watching and you need prayer today we want to remind you that we're here we're here to pray for you so if you're on a platform that has a chat just drop your request right there in the chat and someone will be there to pray for you right now or you can send us an email to prayer at real.life and then one of the ways as a church all together we're able to respond is through our giving and our generosity. We love to partner with different organizations often when it comes to crisis response. And of course, in our own backyards, there's no exception. So today we've opened up a special giving fund called Hurricane Ian Relief. If you head to our connect page through that QR code or real.life slash connect and you click give, one of your options when you go through that process would be to select that fund, all the money given there will go to the local efforts that we'll be doing as a church in our communities to help with the cleanup and response after this event. Well, hey, we're super glad that we're able to be open and gathering today at all of our campuses. And here online, we're actually gonna be streaming to the Claremont campus as Pastor Mark Ballon continues our series, Doomsday Prep. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome our campuses and everybody online. And uh, some of you may be watching us from somewhere a lot more safe. But in case you didn't know, our state took one of the worst hits from a hurricane ever. And yet, here we are. We're gathered in Jesus' name. And he said when we gather in his name, he shows up. I love this. Like, to me, it's in times of crisis where church feels so important to be gathered with my church family right now it feels very special so thank you guys that are part of this and uh, thank you to our volunteers we have some amazing people in our church where other people are like trying to figure out what are we going to do with our damage and woe is us other people are like let's just go make a difference and there's a lot of people like that in our church and it makes jesus look really good and so thank you guys for all that you do um, you know, as we're gathered in Jesus' name, I just wanted to invite him in for a second here, and so let's pray. Lord, I, I just, I think as, as loud as that storm was, as wild as that storm was, it's really in the stillness that we hear your voice. And so we invite you in right now to speak. Show us something that we didn't see, Lord. Tell us something that we need to know. Just speak to us now. We're here. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, we're, we're in a series called Doomsday Prep. 
Told you. Some of you are like, ah, okay. Was I not warning you, right? It's, it's either coming or it's here, but you know, we are always needing to prepare for whatever is ahead. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. We know we need to be ready. Uh, what, what we want to do through this series, though, is, is just look at how we can be prepared in season, out of season. So doomsday prep all of a sudden becomes very relevant. Um, hopefully you didn't suffer too much loss. I know Robin and I are not totally sure. We're in the thousands right now. We don't know how many thousands, but like, you know, the things you think are important in times like these, you realize they're not as important as you thought they were. We have our family. We're blessed in that way. So we're really thankful. Uh, some of our church families displaced right now. People got flooded out of their homes, but, uh, just thanking God for his grace to us as we, we, we help each other out. This is a great time to be the church. And uh, this is a weird weekend for me, by the way, because I was actually scheduled to guest preach at another church, which I rarely do, like maybe once a year. The one time in probably 18 months I was going to guest speak at another church, hurricane. So I won't be guest speaking. Uh, I won't be scheduling that, I guess, anytime soon. I, I don't hope that that was my fault. But I was supposed to guest speak at a church in Windermere, and we are both like, hey, we need to be speaking to our churches. So Rob and I were taking a prayer walk on Friday and just asking God to speak to us and because you know when you guest preach here's a little pro tip when you guest preach you get to take an old message that you've already written that you think is good and you just get to show up like it was brand new when you preach at your home church they don't let you do that you got to write a new one okay so that happened yesterday um, so but we're prayer walking on Friday and did anybody notice how beautiful it was on Friday Storm comes through. It was nasty. It was insane. And then I thought we had died in the hurricane and that we were resurrected into North Carolina. I was like, Lord, it was so beautiful. Like low humidity. It felt like fall for a second. And I loved it. It was so beautiful. But in the midst of all the beauty and what a perfect day it was. So sunshine and just like calm. And, but as we're walking, we're stepping over debris tree remnants and branches and even actual downed trees, moss everywhere. And I felt like the Lord, we're praying and just said, this is your life. And I got kind of choked up because it's like, yeah, it's so true. He said, this is your life. This is life. This is your world. It's beauty and brokenness at the same time, all the time. Do you, you see that pattern in your own life? There's the beauty of God and the grace and the goodness, but at the same time, there's brokenness and there's sin and there's tension and there's pain. And we got to hold both because while we have this bad, he said, I promise to make good out of that bad for those who love me and are called according to my purpose. So I'm walking through the, the beauty and the brokenness of this storm. And, and God's just saying, that's, that's the story of life. And it, it took me to this principle that God gives us in John chapter 3. We'll be in John chapter three. And here's the thing I think that most of us want in life. By the way, it's not the thing that God wants for our life, but it's the thing that we want in life. We want control. We want some level of ability to say, I have order in my life. I, I'm making these decisions and I'm getting these outcomes. We want to work towards, a lot of us even pray towards being in control, having order. We wanna know, predict, plan, and even perfect our lives, especially as Americans, right? There's this sense that we are in control. We're self-sufficient. We're independent. We can do this. And usually in times of crisis, we kind of pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we get going uh, because that's what we know to do. Even those of us who are Christians, as American Christians, it's usually more this sense that God helps those who help themselves. So we're, we're going in this direction and we're asking God to bless it. Lord, would you please help me fulfill my plans for my life? To which God usually replies, no. <laughs> At least that's my experience and that's what I read in the Bible. That's not God and it's certainly not Jesus. And so when the storms of life come, when things go wrong, when things go south, when things get sideways, we tend to wonder, where are you, God? How could you let this happen? Why aren't you doing your job? God, you had one job. It was to make sure that my life worked out the way I told you I wanted it to. And he's going, yeah, I didn't sign up for that. You're gonna have a hard time finding a contract with my name on it because that's not what I do. And so what I find about God is where, where we want control, 
he often gives us chaos. Anybody else? (laughs) Where we want certainty, he gives us mystery. Where we want answers, so often what God gives us is more questions. You notice that in the Bible, people ask Jesus a question. They'll be like, "Uh, teacher, what about this? And he goes, well, what about that? And you go, "Ah." (laughs) Where we want assurance, God invites us to a life of faith. It's very different. So in John chapter 3, back to that, John chapter 3, this man named Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus, and he's a lot like us. He's got things figured out. He's got a plan. He's got a lot of answers. He's pretty sure of himself. He's a Pharisee, so he's actually a high-ranking, knowledgeable, self-made, independent person. But he knows that there's something special about Jesus, and he senses that he might be missing something. And so he actually sneaks off at night, and he comes to the guy who's been disrupting everything, messing up the system. He's the one turning tables and teaching things no one's ever heard. Here's what God says happens. This is John chapter three, and starting with verse one. Okay, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night, and he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God. No one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Does anybody see the disconnect in the conversation? Where Nicodemus is like, hey, just want to say you're a great guy, big fan of what you do, want to introduce myself, and just, you know, like you're obviously from God, and so cool, good on you, man. And Jesus just goes, yeah, nobody gets into the kingdom without being born again. You're like, oh, cool, 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 good talk. (laughs) Yeah, okay. I feel like there was a disconnect. You ever had that in a conversation where you're trying to say one thing, and the other person seems like they're talking right past you and saying another? Yeah, it's called marriage. Those of you who are married when... (laughs) That's why we just read the paper, right? And such a weird thing, but Jesus knows what he's thinking. Jesus knows what he's feeling. Jesus knows what he's really after. And he goes for the punch here. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and you do not understand these things? What, what an amazing conversation, but I love that Jesus brings the wind into it. Did you notice that? He talks about the wind. He says, well, here's what you gotta understand about God. He's like the wind. And in the Greek, it's the word pneuma. Pneuma is wind, it's breath, it's spirit. Now, we can understand this, this concept of wind because we just had a major hurricane, and he says, you see the effects of the wind, you hear the wind, but, but none of us had control over that wind, right? We heard it, we saw the effects, but we couldn't tell it where to go. We have people praying for it to go in another direction, which by the way, that's selfish. (laughs) You know when you're like, Lord, just please keep it south, and people down south are like, Lord, send it up north, and it's just like, ah, it's like Avatar, just trying to pray this thing in another direction. The wind blows wherever it pleases, we can't control it, we can't even predict it. Jesus says, guess what? That's life with the Spirit. You're not in control. He is. You don't know what's coming or what's coming from it. He does. It's not your plan. It's his. It's not your will. It's the wind. It's the pneuma. It's the Spirit. And, you know, of course, this frustrates Nicodemus as it would most of us as he's trying to process, well, what does this mean? And here's what's crazy to me. Jesus made a meteorological statement 2,000 years ago that's still accurate today. How awesome is that? He says, no one knows about the wind. No one knows where it's going. And uh, I would say in the year 2022, why is he still right? Why why do we still not know where, because nobody expected that thing to go from that side to that side. We, up to the minute, we don't know where this thing's going. I'm going, look, we have flying cars. You guys know that, right? You're on the internet occasionally. 
Google that. We're, we have flying cars. We've had flying cars for a couple decades. We just can't use them yet because we don't have roads for flying cars. That's a whole thing. We have flying cars, which doesn't help me at all because neither can I afford one nor am I allowed to operate one. But you know what would help me? Like accurate weather predictions? That would bless my soul. Seeing cars fly around would just make me envious, but somebody saying, hey, we actually know what's gonna happen with the weather today. What a blessing in Florida. You know, to, okay, to my meteorologist members, I would just encourage you, could you please get better at your job? Yes. And that's all I'm asking, and I'm not saying you're bad, I'm just saying, can you get better? Because can you imagine if I was as bad at my job? <laughs> Pastor, are we going to heaven or hell? I don't know, 50% chance. 50% chance of rain, 50% chance of sunshine. I don't know. Magic eight ball. Wow. Blows my mind. We still don't know where it comes from, where it's going, what speed. Robin, you know, like we all were, you obsessively check all the different stations and websites, and you're like, so Robin's looking at one thing, I'm looking at another. She says, I think this thing's coming right towards us. I go, I don't think it's going to hit us at all. And she, so she asked me, she's like, are you looking at American or European models? To which I said, you're the only model I'm looking at. <laughs> Boom, still got it. Okay. Marriage test, passed. <laughs> but we just didn't know. And, and so, like Jesus said, that's how it is. That's how it is. You don't see it coming. You're not really prepared for it. No one knows where it comes from, where it's going. And he said, but you got to understand, that's life with the Spirit. It's not a life of control and calculation. It's a life of submission and surrender. The life with the Spirit is not a life of power and predictability. It's a life of trust and acceptance. It's not a life where we're in control, but it's a life where we respond to the control and power of God. And so what Jesus said 2,000 years ago is still true today. Meteorologically and spiritually, we can't control the wind. The wind controls us. It blows through and we see and hear the effects, but we have no power. It blows, what he says, wherever it pleases. And so what we need to do is we need to surrender to the wind, the pneuma of God, the spirit of God, and just say, God, I'm yours. I'm here, do your thing. Blow wind, blow. Do what you're gonna do. Take this life in whatever direction you please, because it's not mine, it's yours. Move how you see fit, lead where you wanna go. You're God, I'm not. Lord, you're the wind, I'm just here waiting on you to move. And when we do that, okay, listen, <laughs> when we surrender to the Spirit of God and we submit to the wind of God in our lives, that's when things start to shift. That's mountains move and miracles manifest when we surrender to God's wind. What did Jesus say to his disciples? He's leaving and, and they're all hopped up on like the great commission and ready to go. And they said, what do you want us to do? He says, go and wait. Go and wait, go in that upper room. And he says, wait on the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1-8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit, the wind, comes on you. And in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit shows up and it says, with the sound of a roaring or violent what? Wind. We know what that sounds like. Were you in your house? Could you hear that thing? And the way a couple of my doors work, it was whistling through the house. It sounded like a train. That's what it sounded like when the Holy Spirit showed up in Acts chapter 2, the sound of a violent wind. That's the wind that we need in our lives today. That's the wind that we're waiting on. The power that we're looking for, it comes from submitting to the Spirit of God. We're waiting on the wind of God to blow. We're inviting and welcoming the wind to have its way in us. And our problem is, uh, most of us are not waiting on the wind, we're trying to make our own wind. Huffing, puffing, blowing, and go, <laughs> holding that sheet out, <laughs> and just not going anywhere. We're, instead of waiting on the wind, we're making wind. <laughs> That'll preach right there. Come on, somebody. How many of you know that when you make wind, you bless no one? Yeah. <laughs> My wife is here. She said amen really loud. <laughs> you know, I, and I mean, there's only one thing to think of. Actually, it's, I'm, I'm just going to confess this to you. A friend of mine, I was going on a pastoral retreat with some of our leaders, and before the retreat, 
my friend who also is the executive pastor of this church bought me a device that when pressed properly makes wind. So I used that at our pastoral retreat and uh, the person who led our retreat uh, prayed against it. He said, Lord, I just want you to forgive this pastor. (laughs) But it was really funny. You know, when you make wind, you make a mess. (laughs) When you make wind, you, you don't make friends, but are you trying to make your own wind? We can't do that. Or are you waiting on the wind of God to blow through your life? When it does, when, because listen, you can't predict the wind. You can't control the wind. But when you wait on the wind, that wind that can cause destruction can also fill your sails and move you forward. When you get in step with the Spirit, the Bible says, to keep in step with the Spirit. When you feel the wind of God blowing, you say, I want to go in that direction. I feel it, and I'm repenting. I'm turning with that wind, and I'm going with you, God, not asking you to go with me. That's when, when we wait on that wind, Isaiah says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with the wings, the wind, right, that guides the eagles. That can be ours. But for a lot of us, we're not waiting on the wind. We're working for our own wind. We're working when we should be waiting. And that's why we're experiencing not the power, but the drain. We're striving when we should be surrendering. You can't make wind, you can just invite it to blow. And so for most of us, here's the thing. The problem isn't the problem. For most of us, the wind isn't the problem. We think the wind is the problem. It it blows where it wants and then we see the effects and then we're trying to recover from the, the problem isn't really the problem. Our response to the problem is the problem. In life, this is what happens. I'm gonna say that again. The problem is rarely the problem. It's our response to the problem that's the problem. Do you remember the story? Here's another wind story, a little storm story, but do you remember? The disciples are hanging out with Jesus. They actually go on the boat with Jesus, which is, that's a great, that's a great Sunday, in my opinion. You're out on the lake, you're going wakeboarding, you brought a picnic lunch, and you have Jesus. Isn't that like the perfect Sunday? And Jesus is not only on the boat, he's sleeping on the boat. The Son of God sweetly napping in the stern of the boat. I think that's an amazing, beautiful day, until it's not. Matthew chapter eight, here's what he says happens. They got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Uh, Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. There's that darn wind again. This is the wind. It causes problems, but, but it wasn't the wind that was the problem. See, the problem wasn't the problem for Jesus. The problem was their reaction to the problem. And that's why when he wakes up, he doesn't calm the sea and the winds and the waves. What does he do? He rebukes the disciples first. Now, granted, when I wake up from a nap, I can be a little grouchy. And he was made, you know, he's God, but he's also man. So I don't know, you just woke the man up from a nap. But, but Jesus noticed that the first thing he does is he says, the problem isn't the problem. The problem is your reaction to the problem. Why are you so afraid? Why do you have such little faith? Oh, and by the way, can I get the wind machine shut down? Thank you. That's easy for Jesus. The, the storm around us is nothing to him. It's the storm inside us. Why was it not enough that I was in the boat? Why was it not enough that I was with you? Why was it not enough uh, that I've prom- Why was it not enough that you've already seen me do these things? Why was that not enough? Why did you, you need, I didn't promise you a storm-free life. You read the Bible? Anybody skim through it at least? Picture Bible, anything? You've heard sermons online, great, okay. But nowhere in here does it say that, that God says you'll never have any problems, you'll never have any storms, nothing bad will ever happen. He says, no, you're gonna walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Don't have to fear though, why? Because I'm with you, I'm with you. Jesus was with them sleeping on the boat. He said, I promise not to, to, to prevent storms, I promise to be with you in every storm. That's the promise we're missing and that's why we are lacking the peace. You know, Jesus, he doesn't get angry often. Actually, he had an anointing of gladness was prophesied about him. I believe he was a very happy person, but he gets angry a few times, usually at religious people for trying to control, and only a few times at his disciples, but every time, 
it was for a lack of faith. Guys, I just need you to trust me. I just need you to believe me. And instead, they, they come to him and they say, we are going to drown. In Mark's version, it actually says the disciples came to him and said, don't you care? Don't you care that we're going to drown? That's interesting because I don't know what your personality type is, but mine has said that to God before. And you know what? Here, here's what I found is I don't always say things out loud to God. I think sometimes I just say them quietly inside. And so instead of saying, God, don't you care? Where are you? Why? A lot of times I just feel that, and so I still go to church. But I subtly and bitterly kind of resent that you don't do it my way because I have an expectation, but I'm, I'm not gonna say it out loud because I know it's unreasonable. I'm still gonna feel it anyway. Marriage, again, same thing, right? It's relationship, and I'm just like, God, you disappointed me, and why? And don't you care? It feels like you don't care. Here's what I've come to understand about God. Just because he doesn't, spare us doesn't mean he doesn't care for us. Right. A lot of times I'm expecting God to spare me from something. Just because he doesn't spare me doesn't mean he doesn't care about me. That storm is coming either way. You will go through hardship, that's what he said. It's gonna happen. In this life, you will have trouble. You'll suffer loss, storms will come, hardships heading your way. You gotta know that, you gotta expect that. You gotta prepare for that, even welcome that. You know, the Bible doesn't just say to endure this stuff. It actually says to rejoice in this stuff. Why? Because for every pain, there's a plan. For every problem, there's a purpose. For every mess, there's actually a message that is coming out of that. And I think for so many of us, the problem is we stop short of the message and we're just left with the mess. We, we don't see it through. We're, we're so busy trying to resist the wind and redirect the wind, that we don't allow the wind to do its work so that we may be mature and complete. And so instead of getting a message, we just get the mess. Instead of, instead of getting the plan, we just get the pain. Instead of getting the promise of God, we just get the problem at hand. Because usually when we're in that storm, we're looking around and we're looking down. And he says, fix your eyes up here and you'll see something you don't see. See, the problem isn't the problem. Our reaction to the problem is the problem. When we choose control instead of trust, listen, you can't control the wind. You're gonna be frustrated with God if you're trying to control that pneuma. It's gonna blow where it blows. When we choose panic instead of peace, you don't know where it's going. You don't know where it comes from. Can you, can you let God run the show without running everything by you? It's gonna be crucial. The problem isn't the problem. But here, the, the actual problem, our reaction to the problem is so bad that Jesus said, uh, here's the thing, to fix that, you must be born again. We, we actually can't like just do surgery on what you've got, we've gotta just give you a whole new thing. And, and so Nicodemus is like, what are you even talking about? I'm just, yo, I'm just trying to be a good person, do the best I can, need a little help from above, okay? I think that's most people. I actually had a guy helping me out with some stuff, um, and he said, I'll be there Sunday morning. I said, I won't. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, he goes, send one in for me, man. Send one in for I'm just a good old boy trying to make a living. And I said, you got it. I'll send one in for you. But most of us just trying to be good, just trying to be better, and just asking God to bless that effort. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is like, Nicodemus, here's the thing, man. God doesn't want you better. He wants you born again. He doesn't want to just... Uh, give you a better life. He wants you to be born again into a totally new life because you don't need self-improvement. You need total surrender. You don't need uh, reconstruction. You need resurrection, and that's what God specializes in. He's not here to help us fix up the old. He's here to make us a new creation in Christ, and you know, when Nicodemus hears this, I think just like us, it's funny because he starts trying to figure out what he can do about it. Hey, you, you must be born again. Okay, um, well, let me figure out how to do that. I'm gonna have to have a long talk with my mom and I don't think she's gonna like it. That doesn't, like, do you have to, mm, yeah, that seems weird. He's actually thinking, how can I do this? What do I need to do? But, but that's the point. Being born again isn't something I do. It's something he does, right? It's not by works so that no one can boast. It's the gift of God, it's not about what I do to attain it, it's about what Christ has already done 
for me. And so the life of the Spirit, the resurrected life, the new life in Christ comes not from me, but it, it, it comes when I surrender to him, when I allow and invite the wind to blow wherever it pleases. We're born again when we come to Jesus and we give him lordship over our life. We give him the control, the authority, the power. Jesus says you're born of water and the spirit. Blow wind, do whatever you want, and then we're baptized into him. It's such a beautiful picture of our surrender to Christ. And listen, this is true in not just our spiritual life. This is every area of life. Because I think one of the problems that church people make is that we compartmentalize. And we live Monday to Saturday, and then we give God an hour and a half. And we can all be on our best behavior for an hour and a half, for me, about 45 minutes. But still, like most of us can just come and we can be like, okay, I'll be good for now, but it's really about everyday life. He doesn't wanna be Lord of just your eternal life. He wants to be Lord of your everyday life. And so for most of us, we spend our days trying to get better and fix this and improve that, but yet we still stay in control. We have the power. We just ask God to help us here, help us there. Some of you right now are trying to fix your life, trying to fix different areas of your life, and you're finding out how frustrating it is, aren't you? You ever try to, um, you ever try to fix your spouse? Anybody married try to fix your spouse? You're single now, huh? Robin's been trying to fix me for 25 years. It's the only thing she's not good at. I don't even, have you even really moved the needle? Anyway, we can't change other people. We can't fix other people. I can't fix you, but I can surrender me, right? I can't change you, but I can invite the wind to change me. I can't fix you, but I can be born again into something new. And you wanna change your marriage, guess what? Here's a pro tip, change yourself. You, ch you let the Holy Spirit change you, it changes everything. It changes every relationship you're in. And I can't be born again unless I submit, surrender, and let him do something that I can't do for myself. What we find out is when we trust the wind to blow in our lives and the spirit to move in our lives, after he changes things in me, I see that he starts changing things around me. Never before, but after he changes that stuff. And parents, you wanna, you wanna change your children Change you, change your parenting, change the way you trust God and the way you model him in your home. Be born again, be born of God. Financially, this is one of the areas so many people want help, need help, I just need better, I just need more. But what if instead of asking God to fix your current reality, you were born again into a new reality where Jesus was Lord. It's not your money, it's his. He's Lord of your life. It's not what you feel, it's what he says. I've never known anybody that, that made Jesus Lord of their finances and regretted it. Nobody's ever come to me and said, you know, Jesus has been running the show in my life for a while and he has botched things up. <laughs> but like everybody I talk to is like, well, I keep doing this and this keeps happening. And I'm like, yeah, because that's, you're doing the same thing and expecting a different result. You know, like you can't do what you want and expect God to bless it. He won't. My single friends, I got a bunch. I, 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 you're dating, you know, I, the pressure of trying to find the right one is real. And you want the right one for all the right reasons, but what if I just let the wind of God blow in my life, I was born again and I became the right one for someone else. And then I trusted God to do the matchmaking in his time when he's ready. And I quit huffing and puffing and blowing and going and trying to make my own wind. And I waited on the wind. I believe Jesus is calling us to come to the end of ourselves, the end of our power and our plans and our control and surrender all that to him. Because here, here's the thing I found, when I come to the end of me, that's when I come to just the beginning of who he is and what he can do in my life. When I get to the end of what I can do, I just barely start tapping into what he can do. Where I stop, that's where he starts. When I'm done, that's when God's just getting started in my life. And so thank you, Lord. You don't, you don't want me better. You're inviting me to be born again. What would it look like in your life right now? If you gave God control, maybe for the first time, maybe all over again, 
Lord, I'm going to trust you again. I'm going to believe again. What would you need to let go of and give to him that you're holding hard to? What would it look like if he was really Lord of your life? Here's some hints. What are you worried about? What are you afraid of? What do you think might happen if you don't do everything in your power? What are you trying to control? You know, the spirit is blowing in your life right now. Let him have his way. Quit trying to be better and be born again by the spirit of God. If you've never done this, some of you need to do this for the first time and just say, I think this makes a lot of sense and this is why I've lived in frustration because I'm trying to control things I can't. I've been resisting the wind and today, Lord, I'm inviting it into my life. You do that for the first time, you're gonna feel the wind of God, the breath of God, the pneuma of the spirit blowing in your life and it's an amazing thing when you're born of water and the spirit. Some of you today, listen, he's ready for you. He's waiting on you. He died to make this happen. He's crazy about you. All you gotta do is say the word. Welcome the wind, Lord. I make you, I, I make you Lord of my life and I invite you in. He's ready for that. Some of you, it's maybe something you've done, maybe even many times before, but he's ready for that fresh wind to blow in your life. He's ready to blow new and, and strong and fresh in you. He's waiting, he's ready, he's crazy about you. As I close us in prayer, if you would just close your eyes. But when I pray, something I do sometimes is I feel like the Lord just reminds me to breathe. Just exhale, inhale. And as I do that, I'm reminded of the pneuma, the spirit, the wind, the breath. As I inhale, I'm reminded of the breath of God, Lord, that you breathed into our nostrils to make us a living being. Wow. Lord, as we inhale today, would you reanimate us? Would you bring us back to life through your breath, through your spirit? Just inhale the grace and the goodness, the mercy. And then as I exhale, I gotta push out the fear, the worry, the anxiety. My need to control, Lord, I exhale that. I cast that stuff on you because you care for me. I come to you because I'm weary and burdened. I exhale that, Lord, and I inhale who you are and what you've done and how you feel about me, Lord, thank you. In this moment, Lord, we just give you praise this breath that not only you breathed into us, but Jesus, you breathed on your disciples to impart your peace after you were resurrected. And I pray that for us today, that there would be a, a fresh wind from your breath, Lord, that would breathe peace on your people. As we learn to keep in step with your spirit, God, as we learn to submit and surrender to your spirit, we know we can't control the wind. Some of us are, are worn out from resisting it and trying to will it in another direction, Lord, and so today we surrender to it. And we invite your spirit to blow in our lives. However you please, however you see fit, Lord, just come and have your way. There's no better way than your will. And so we submit, we surrender, and I pray today that this would be the start of something new. We didn't come here to get better, Lord. We came here to be born again by the Spirit of God. That you wouldn't just fix the old, but you'd resurrect something new in our lives. You don't specialize in reconstruction, Lord. You're famous for resurrection. Would you do it in us? And, and as we give you our lives, we know that you promised that we would be a new creation in Christ, and we give you all the glory. It's in his name, amen. Thank you so much for tuning in online here with us. We just want to remind you that we have that special Hurricane Ian Relief Fund open on our give page right now, real.life slash give, if you want to help us be a part of our response after this storm this week. Thank you guys so much for showing up, for worshiping with us, for your generosity and partnering with us and just being the hands and feet of Jesus where you live. We love you guys and we'll see you next time.